Okay, today uh, with me again is Professor Guy McPherson. The, he comes from the University of Arizona. He's Professor Emeritus there, and he's Professor of Ecology and uh, in Evolutionary Biology. So last time we had you on, uh, we were talking about the death strike for climate. And I was, I think we were on the same page, you and I, that we we probably, if we're not on the actual last page of our story, we're somewhere near the end of the last chapter. Um, but still, I think, you know, we should be doing activism. We should be cleaning up the mess and, you know, making a good exit. There are a lot of bad ways this movie can end. And uh, I think there's some, some reasonably good ways that it can end too. And we should try and work for those outcomes. So today I wanted to talk to you um, about the follow-on from that death strike. The death strike was, was a proposal to Extinction Rebellion and XR. And I want to hear what, uh, what you have to say more about XR and tell you about the response that, that I got. <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to chat again. I very much enjoyed our latest conversation. <clears throat> it's pretty clear that some of the commenters on the troll farm didn't appreciate it nearly as much as I did. There are certain things we don't have any control over. That's fine. So, uh, X, uh, you know, a few words come to mind when I think about XR. Uh, I think they're cynical. I think they're dishonest. I think they've been co-opted by the mainstream or corporate media. And it took me a long time to come to that conclusion because like you, I'm a fan of action and I saw what they were doing, what they were calling for as for the most part, reasonable actions. But when you're getting advertisements in the guardian and you repeatedly hear about the aerosol masking effect and still you never talk about it. You never mention it as an outcome of slowing or terminating industrial civilization. Then I have real problems with that. And mostly it's the dishonesty that caused me to get rid of as many of those people as I could in terms of social media. And here I'm thinking specifically about Roger Hallam and Gil Bradbrook and Allison Green and pretty much anybody who sends me a request to connect on social media and they have that XR symbol on their, on across their face. That's it. That's all I need to hear. These are people who are interested in attracting attention, but are unwilling to tell the full truth about the dire predicament in which we are embroiled. And personally, I don't have time for that. So if that comes across as a little harsh, well, maybe it is, but time is short for me and for everybody else. We don't have time to play games. And that's what I think XR is doing is playing games. Okay. So that is a bit of a surprise. So it was quite a strong reaction. I've, I've been sitting on the fence and I've kind of been thinking, you know, we shall know them by their fruits and if they have false prophets. Um, they'll show their hand. The thing that disturbs me a little bit about them is that the tactics are a bit too mild. They're kind of smelling a bit of astroturf. And I think this is pretty much exactly what you would expect um, if it's, you know, astroturf and it's kind of an Eddie Bernays kind of manufacturing consensus. It does have that outward appearance. It, it's very light on the philosophy where they're actually going. Um, it's, you know, do something, do something, do something. It's an appeal to politicians. Um, what, what do you say about, about that aspect? Does it pass the smell test? Because a lot I, of people have asked me in, in, on social media. I couldn't agree more. You know, I interviewed Roger Hallam on my radio show um, back in December of 2018. And I tried to get him to talk about the aerosol masking effect and he just kept dodging and moving away. Subsequently, I informed him uh, via email, as well as Allison Green and also Gail Bradbuck, that they, that they cannot continue to lie by omission regarding the aerosol masking effect or global dimming. And doing so has the potential to destroy people's lives. Exhibit one, right in front of you. 
had I known about the aerosol masking effect, I never would have given up my privileged position in which I was able to reach uh, a few hundred people and have access to an educational system that allowed me to continue my lifelong passion of teaching. I didn't know about the aerosol masking effect. I, I made a huge mistake in trying to step away from industrial civilization. And it cost me pretty much every relationship in my life. Had I known about the aerosol masking effect, I would have acted differently. And by not including that, perhaps the most important aspect of climate science, by not including that element, the folks at XR are, in my opinion, being, again, very cynical and certainly dishonest because I know that they know because I've informed them repeatedly. So don't give me this, they don't know, so therefore they can't talk about it. Of course they know. I've told all the people I already mentioned repeatedly, and they still refuse to mention it. So that's very disappointing for me. What do you think about the argument? I mean, they show a lot of signs of trying to, you know, be strategic. They're trying to be popular, and they, they want to keep the, the message positive. They have these role models like MLK and, you know, Gandhi. I don't think they're appropriate role models. I mean, it's, you know, Indian nationalism has nothing to do with um, battle for extinction. And I certainly think that something is wrong with, um, you know, approaching the, the whole impetus implies that politicians have our fate in, in, um, in their hands. And, and I think that's highly debatable. I mean, the politicians by Exile's own admission are bought. Um, so, you know, why is the focus entirely on politicians and this hidden assumption that goes unquestioned that, you know, that they actually have um, control where so obviously they don't. The control is obviously in the, um, in the financial industry and in the fire industry, fire, fire insurance, real estate, and in the oil industry. But um, I've, I've been uh, really soft censored on, on Reddit and social media on their channels um, and their subs because um, I've said things that are too anti-capitalist and I've been told, you know, um, out, out of channel, out of band, that uh, there's, there's um, a commitment to be um, completely neutral on capitalism, and, but uh, they, won't, they won't put it in any rules of the sub or in any of their own rules that you're not allowed to criticize capitalism. Uh, so, you know, red flags went up all over there. I wasn't able to determine if it was <clears throat> just one particular editor or whether it's a hidden policy of theirs. But, um, you know, they're, they're mixed messages, so it's hard to, to tell. I mean, you know, I think Gail Bradbrook came out with XR Business, and it was a kind of disaster that got backpedaled. Um, so that, that was an overreach <laughs> in, uh, in terms of support of capitalism. But there's this continual theme of being business friendly and being establishment friendly and being politician friendly. Um, so that we now, yesterday we, we saw this, um, uh, Gail was uh, giving, was being questioned by the BEIS. It's, uh, it's a committee and they're establishing uh, the British, um, uh, really what is called clean, clean growth strategy is if you haven't heard of a worse oxymoron in your life. And uh, it was a complete debacle, but it has this cultish atmosphere of, yo, you know, this is fantastic. Look at the progress. And so it's, you just saw the politicians abdicate the responsibility of the big business and say that they couldn't do anything uh, because maybe they're not going to upset the market. They're going to allow the market to determine, determine the solution to the climate emergency. And I think, well, hang on, this smells of greenwash, what do you think? Absolutely, it's greenwash, it's like the Green New Deal in the United States. It's, a, it's trying to appeal to the masses as if there's some magic bullet that will solve this insoluble problem. And all we have to do is throw a little greenwashing at it and it'll be fine. Well, that's obviously not the case. It took us a long time to get to this point. As a society, it took capitalism a long time to get us to the brink of extinction. And, and now we're gonna come out and say that we're anti-capitalist, but we're pro every other aspect of the system. We're pro-politician, we're pro the market, we're pro this, we're pro that, but we're anti-capitalism. Do you think they're somehow unrelated to each other? 
This is insane. So, you know, I'm no fan of, the, of capitalism. I'm no fan of industrial civilization. I've been saying that for 15 years now in public. So don't get me wrong, but to assume that we can make minor tweaks to the system at this point and avoid human extinction is nonsense. To assume that we can even make major changes and avoid human extinction is nonsense. To, you know, I see these conversations online very frequently and they begin with a question like, such as, what are the odds we'll go extinct? A hundred percent people, all species go extinct. Every single one. It's like asking, what are the odds that I'm going to die? Okay, so we can debate what are the odds I'm going to die today? What are the odds I'm going to die in the next month? What are the odds I'm going to die in the next 15 years? And that's, that's what actuaries do for the life insurance business. But let's not debate whether I'm going to die. Of course I'm going to die. Let's not debate whether our species is going to go extinct. Of course it's going to go extinct. It's only a matter of timing. You can accelerate it by reducing industrial activity, as we discussed last time, and as I've been pointing out repeatedly, but XR refuses to admit that. You know, at some point, and so many of these things are out of our control, and by our, I mean you and me and, and approximately 7.6 billion other people on the planet. So much of this is beyond our control. What do we have control over? Relatively minor factors, actually, within our own personal lives. And that's about it. If I had the ability to tweak capitalism, I would have started mm, at least 35 years ago when I realized there was something seriously wrong. And, and surely 35 years ago, a bunch of other people knew there was something seriously wrong who were in a position of much greater power than I'm in. I think that we have trundled too far down this scorched earth path and what we're seeing is a scorched earth in our wake let's be honest about that let's be honest in pointing out to people every aspect of climate change including the aerosol masking effect let's stop with the cynicism and the finger pointing and the appealing to the masses so that we will be popular and you might have noticed that I haven't been popular for quite a long time. So maybe I'm a relatively solitary figure on this particular point. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't do yourself down. <laughs> I think your popularity could be yet to come. But uh, what do you say to the argument? Uh, I, I like the idea of extending our time. I don't like the idea of extending our time, uh, the, the system's time. But I mean, I kind of imagine, you know, it's kind of... Uh, anarchic utopia is possible, especially in adversity. I would like to see the system made more diversified, more robust. Um, and so, you know, even though we have a rough time ahead and inevitable extinction probably in the near term, we can still uh, approach it from a point of view of solidarity. Um, uh, particularly the thing that scares me is if, um, as things get worse and the mere fact that people are not ready for them, there's a shock value and people are running into the arms already of authoritarians because basically you're running for the shelter of the, you know, the, the strongest uh, looking protector. And of course, the far right wins hands down there I and mean, the, the left can't compete on in those terms. So um, I think there are a lot of things to do. One of them is to you know, stop this drift towards right wing authoritarianism would be a good start. The other thing is to, if those authoritarians authoritarians manage our extinction, I can imagine this kind of nightmare. I've made videos on you know, the managed extinction nightmare. I imagine, you know, Katrina type disasters um, on a broad scale and look how Katrina was managed. That's a role model for, for how, you know, America's extinction is going to be managed. National extinction is going to be managed. And it's, it's a disaster. The, you know, the authorities will, you know, you can foresee FEMA camps, you can see, you know, uh, quarantine, and you can see starvation and just, you know, essentially labor camps turn into death camps, as we saw at the collapse of, uh, you know, the Third Reich. 
So this right should not collapse in the same way. We should do everything we can to prepare people for that, and particularly rein in this individualist ethic of, of you know, I'm going to prep it and survive it, and say so you're not going to prep it and survive it. You have to start thinking more in terms of community, and try and reveal the stories of places like Katrina where. There was community. It was broken up by the police and the mayor coming back in armed and trying to introduce martial law and saying, you know, we need to take back our city. Well, we need to start saying to authoritarians, this is not your city. This city belongs to the people and don't interfere. Stop shooting people that are trying to distribute some of the goods and calling them looters and you know, attacking people that are distributing water from, you know, essential services from water trucks, which is things that happened and got papered over. Um, so I think in, in those terms, it doesn't make sense to say that can uh, a movement like XR expand, become popular, and then be used as a vehicle for these other initiatives that kind of make a fairer, more just, a more dignified extension. What do you think? I couldn't agree more. I think you bring up two really important points there. One, we need to tell the full truth to everybody. It's interesting that that's one of XR's three principles, that they require the governments to tell the truth. Well, when, is, when has any government ever told the truth? And, and XR is unwilling to tell the truth, obviously, about the aerosol masking effect. So they demand it from somebody else, but they're unwilling to do it themselves. So yes, I agree, we need to tell the full truth, not this halfway nonsense that we've all become accustomed to at this point. And you bring up another point, which is how do we manage our extinction. There's a, a paper recently from uh, the senior curator at the Museum of Modern Art indicating we need to manage our extinction. So she got it. She got it. You know, we're going extinct. And she was indicating that we need to manage it in a, in a graceful way. I can't remember the exact term she used, but it was reaching acceptance, becoming fully aware, and acting with grace. And I think that's wonderful. You know, I was teaching anarchism and modeling anarchism in my classrooms for many years at the University of Arizona. And that's one of the reasons that I wasn't the most popular faculty member as far as the administration was concerned, because universities are part of this system that is very much oligarchic in nature. It's, for the most part, pretty top-down. And so trying to encourage students through classroom activities to learn on their own and to facilitate the learning of the other people around them just didn't sell well, to say the least. So I think, personally, I think that's a great way to manage a more gentle extinction, a more compassionate extinction than what we're doing now. This overwhelming totalitarianism that has been on its way and has been creeping forward and but only within the last few years has become apparent to most people is obviously the wrong way to go about anything and you bring up an excellent example with Katrina in 2005 the federal government was absolutely confused and they acted as if they were confused. They took all the wrong steps. Same sort of thing happened with Hurricane Sandy in New York State. I don't remember the year, but it was individuals acting, following the principles of anarchism. Those individuals were feeding the FEMA workers. The, FEMA, the whole FEMA system was overwhelmed by that one storm and so they couldn't manage it. They couldn't adjust to it. They had presumably access to all kinds of federal money to deal with the situation. And they couldn't. They were overwhelmed. And that's the thing. These top-down systems, whether you, no matter what name you call them, capitalism, socialism, whatever, they just don't work. Communism. So they're all symbolic of civilization of the ability to store food and therefore control the people. So we're trying to control people at some level. Let's let the people assume control of themselves for themselves. That's the anarchistic approach. And it worked a lot better in the wake of Hurricane Sandy than anything the government threw at it. So why don't we 
try to give as much evidence of people as we can and allow them to take responsibility for themselves. Will it work every time? No, of course not. Is the current model working every time? If you think this is working, you, you have a lot different perspective than I do. Yeah, um, I wouldn't even say it's working in parts. <laughs> what it's working to do is uh, sustain itself. It's a, a self-referential, self-sustaining system, but so is cancer. I, I would say it's working for a few people really quite well. Well, cancer works for a few cells, I'm sure. You bet <laughs> Somewhere it along the line, but it died for the cancer because it killed its host and it died for the host. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a cancer. I couldn't agree more. So, yeah, the, there's still, though, this, this nagging question of if, what, what we can do against it. And I, I, I know uh, individual action, we passed individual action in terms of uh, trying to, you know, take care of the environment. It's, it's not under threat from individuals, it's under threat from the system. So it makes no sense to take individual action. It needs systemic response to systemic action. But following that logic through then, although you can only be a gadfly on the system, the kind of gadfly I'm trying to be is trying to, you know, basically agitate for things like attacking the financial system. Um, and so there's been a lot of pushback, uh, which I find very, very suspicious because it's just a plum waiting there. I mean, it's such low hanging fruit. This uh, putrid camel is just about to, it's on its last legs and, you know, XR already had the muscle to be the last straw that could break its back. And, that, that would be the first move of the people against the system that underpins it. But you won't hear a, a peep out of it, although I think there's huge opportunity. So just, I just want to say one more thing on that. And that's that, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of talk about, oh, industrial, they barely talk about industrialization, but when they do, it's kind of like, uh, like it was mentioned in this BIS, uh, I'm trying not to call it the BS committee, um, which Gail um, <coughs> basically answered questions to yesterday. And they say, well, you know, the Industrial Revolution started here in Manchester. And then it's all, you know, they, well, yeah, it's the Industrial Revolution is the problem. But come on, I mean, who hasn't got the insight to see that it was serving the financial industry from the get-go? The, the Industrial Revolution only started in Manchester because all the big wigs in London did, didn't want the smog and pea soup smog in, in, on their own doorstep. That's, you know, otherwise it would have started in London, but it, did, it started in Manchester to service the financial industry. Nobody said, hey, we need all these widgets. People said we needed to get rich. And the widgets were to try and make these people in London rich. And we've just extended it from there. So now we've got to a certain way, the same old nexus that started with the Industrial Revolution 1850 is still there. It's extended to New York, but in the New York-London nexus is still the financial nexus that started this whole thing. But why won't uh, people accept that, talk about it, and uh, stop feeding the beast, or just at least start trying to be a gadfly like me and, uh, and start to you know, pick away at the beast? Uh, you know, even the Occupy movement did that much. Yeah, you know, I've been railing against the, what you call the fire, finance, insurance, real estate, um, underpinnings of the set of living arrangements for at least 15 years. And it's, it's clearly that that set of industries has clearly assumed control, basically. So as you pointed out, it's not the politicians who are running things at this point. They're just the lackeys acting on behalf of the people in the fire industries. So, of course, that's a good place to start. Of, of course, the system is teetering on the brink, and that's what I thought a dozen years ago, is that the system was teetering on the brink. And, and so I'm reluctant now to say something like, you know, all we need to do is, is hit these three areas, take your money out of the bank, and it all falls down. I don't know what's going to do it at this point. You know, Ben Bernanke, who was chairman of the Federal Reserve during the 2008-2009 financial crisis, and also in February 2011 when, when he did an interview. In that interview, he said that every bank except one in the United States was within the blink of an eye of failing during the global financial crisis. And he didn't name the one, but it was probably the Federal Reserve Bank you know, the one that underlies all the others. And they call a whole bunch of those banks too big to fail for a reason. 
so when Chase Manhattan or Wells Fargo or one of the other big ones goes under, I suspect it's going to have significant impact on the rest of the system to produce a domino effect that will bring the whole house of cards down. But I've been thinking that for a dozen years, maybe the whole system is more resilient. Obviously, the whole system is more resilient than I think it is. But the system is the problem. You're absolutely right about that. How do we attack it? I used to do these actions and promote other actions that would get at the underpinnings of the whole industrial civilization. And, you know, following the model of Doug Peacock and Edward Abbey and that gang of folks back in the 1970s, trying to destroy the machine that was destroying us. And it had no impact that I could tell. I just don't know what to do at this point beyond continuing my educational efforts. So, and, and I refuse to be the last generation of people failing to warn people that we are in ex an extremely dangerous situation. And, and I think XR falls into the category of wanting to maintain their popularity to such a great extent that they won't go all the way with the evidence. And that's what I find disappointing. How people act is, it's not up to me and you. We can provide all the information we want, and that's my goal. And then, you know, I, I'm, I'm gonna quote Viktor Frankl here in Man's Search for Meaning. Between a stimulus and a response, there is a space. So I view what I'm doing as providing the stimulus, providing the information, providing the evidence. Between the stimulus and the response, there is a space. In that space is the power to choose our response. That is not, that's not up to me and you. We don't get to decide how each individual person is gonna to respond to the stimulus that we're providing. So between a stimulus and a response, there is a space. In that space is the power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom the last of human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any set of circumstances, end quote. And I would add that we can choose not only our attitude, but also our actions, but only us. I've tried to influence individuals for a long time from the relatively esteemed position of a university professor in the front of the classroom for 21 years. I tried to encourage my students to not have children, for example, because I thought that more people would only make the situation worse. There are a handful of my students who, I didn't, who didn't have children out of thousands. <laughs> I can provide the stimulus. I can provide the evidence. I can provide the information. But I don't get to choose the response. And fortunately for my mental well-being, I have managed to let go of the notion that I can choose the response of the people who hear my message. So... You know, I think what you are doing, what I'm doing, and what all the people who are presenting the information to the masses, I think that's all good work. And, and we don't have control over what happens next. Yeah, what about challenging Viktor Frankl here and saying that, uh, challenging him on the point that we actually do have control at all. I mean, I... I think we haven't, you know, there's a lot of evidence to say that we haven't evolved to tackle the mess that we're capable of making. So basically, we're still primates. We still think in terms of risk uh, as primates. We still think in terms of future as a primate. And, you know, we, we have, um, you know, basically uh, uh, loss aversion and we have, um, we have a, what's it called, a bias towards, uh, bias against future reward. I can't remember what that's called now in psychology. But anyway, it's the old thing where you give it somebody, they always put a, a dollar today, even, you know, if it means they could get $2 uh, down the road, they just have this uh, exponential discount. I think it's future discounting that's um, not rational. And so that's pretty much what people are doing. Even if you give them the information, you're just saying, look, um, the opposite of the loads of bananas down the road, there's loads of risk down the road, but they will discount that risk for basically the goodies that they're getting today. And the system draws them in because now it's getting more and more people that are dependent on it. So every time 
you know, the health industry saves somebody, the health uh, system saves someone's life, puts them on insulin, puts them on a drug that's keeping them alive. You've got another recruit that basically to destroy the world. And uh, so it's, you know, basically individual against the collective again. So it's the individual interest against the collective. And, and the, do people really have any truth or any uh, real control, any, any free, freedom of action against the evolution? I mean, to, to me, I think, I mean, I've been doing this other part of this, the work I've been doing, and that's this more esoteric thing. So it's saying, let's get over your ego and you'd be, um, kind of self-destructive or self-sacrificing you know, for the greater whole, um, you don't really have a choice. The mechanisms that make you an individualist uh, make you work against the system so that uh, the in individual and the collective go down the pan. And there's a lot of psychological research you can show this on a little game that you can play where you know people will try and hold back. I mean, we saw it in the video with Gail. That I couldn't believe it, that they actually, you know, are, are so unself-aware in the government that they actually said, you know, we, we're going to have a measured response. We're going to make sure that we don't get ahead of any country. We're not going to take a leadership. We're going to see what other countries are doing so we don't lose our competitive edge. And there's lots of psychological research that says that's a recipe for destruction. There's only a 50-50 chance that you actually come out uh, with the collective saving if you, if you pit individual um, success against the collective. And the fact that a government, a sitting minister in government doesn't know basic psychology like that so much that they will splurge this out for, to be, you know, made, made the laughing stock of the whole world on, on YouTube. It's incredible to me. I mean, the, the, the lack of insight that these people, are, you know, people cheer them on. So right. the question coming back to the question is, do we really have any choice or you know is 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 the you know are we just bound to our evolution and we're just failing the iq test we're never going to outsmart ourselves on a big enough scale okay, you know, some people can do it uh but it doesn't help if you have a few sages that can manage right. it and the mass of people just consume the planet what do you, you think? know we we do know a lot more about free will or our lack of free will than we did more than 60 years ago when Viktor Frankl was writing. So, and I absolutely agree with you based on abundant neurological evidence, neurobiological evidence at this point, we essentially lack free will. Our free will is extremely limited. Our ability to choose in the spirit of Viktor Frankl, the power to choose our response is extremely limited. But I don't know any ethicists or any neurobiologists who would claim that because we essentially lack free will, we should act as if we lack free will. Because where does that go? That goes to, I murdered seven people today, but it's not my fault. I'm a product of my personal history and my genetics. You can't blame me for that. So you can't toss me in jail because I murdered seven people. So this is a particularly thorny place where I we are. Don't, I don't agree with that ethical argument. So really the way I see it is something akin to this, that if we all accepted that we didn't have free will, we'd basically be chimps, right? The planet wouldn't be in trouble. We would actually be self-limited by our natural environment. So it would have been fine. What we've done is we've uh, you know, eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So basically, we've got too clever. Once you've been this clever, then you're in trouble. And also to the, to the thing that's saying, well, everybody's absolved from responsibility. You know, it's, it's the old thing, you know, increasingly people are putting forward evidence that they have a neurological defect that made them into a criminal. And then, you know, and the obvious argument is if you're the judge, you say, well, I'm sorry for that. But anyway, we're putting that module in your brain in prison. You, you can either go with it or, or go without it, but, but it's going to jail. <laughs> so, so, you know, whatever neurons that did the crime, they're going to jail. Go with it or go without it. It's your choice. But anyway, uh, so that's the obvious argument uh, that uh, but it's, uh, you know, we have the ability to outsmart our neurology to a certain extent, but it needs a bit of encouragement from the system. So that you have this um, pump priming problem. 
where to get people to be that smart, um, the system has to be that smart, and the system can't be that smart because nobody will allow it to be. You know, and I think it's a combination of factors. Yes, we're too smart for our own good. We're we're chimps with slightly bigger brains, slightly more complex brains, that were cursed by and blessed by a relatively cool and stable temperature for the last approximately 10,000 years, six to 10,000 years. So that allowed us the ability to grow grains and thus is our disaster because that gives us the ability to go into overshoot and all that goes with that. And the, you know, 10 days later, the sociopaths are in charge. So, you know, if, if, it, so a, a whole bunch of individual steps were required and each of them as nearly as I can tell was necessary. We, we had to have a slightly more developed set of neurological function than our predecessors. And that came through a variety of means that I don't fully understand and that are still under, are still being argued about in the evolutionary community. Was our ability to throw that went alongside with the development of the big brain was a language was at fire. So there's, you know, probably a bunch of contributors. And then in addition, there's the evolutionary drive that pushes us towards flight or fight and then towards procreation, then tack on this slight increase in temperature. And then the stabilization at that temperature that allowed us to grow grains at a relatively large scale. You put all those things together and probably a few thousand more things and we're in a mess. Can we get out of the mess? I think that there are people, although Nietzsche gave up on this idea late in his career, I think there are people who can overcome their evolutionary programming, to call it something a little crude and awkward, and therefore have the ability to choose thoughtfully. How, how rare are, the, are those people? I don't think we know enough to know that. You, Plato suggested that maybe 10% of people in a population are rational throughout their daily lives, leading to a relatively rational life. And S. Jonathan Singer concluded the same thing in his book, Splendid Feast of Reason, in 2001, maybe something like that. Based on considerable, he's a neurobiologist, so he used the recent neurobiological evidence that Plato didn't have access to, obviously. So it could be that there's relatively few people in the population who are capable of making these wise choices. What do we do to those people? Yeah, they we wind up we don't elect them, them, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, all the way from Giordano Bruno to you know Buddha. Uh, Buddha, Buddha escaped. They do better in the in the um, far east than they do um, round about our neck of the woods in Europe. We we uh, we have more of a functional inquisition of you know here. But Joan of Arc, right. a lot of them, they all go. And Confucius and the Buddha, and there were a few wise people that actually got to live their full lives. Yeah, not so much uh, if as you move west. There's a definite bias. But, so just on that that score, um, I have tremendous amounts to say on that. By the way, I'm an absolute heretic. Um, you brought up the conventional Gordon Child's view about uh, you know this grain surplus idea of civilization, which I absolutely loathe. I don't I don't think it makes any sense the uh, stable temperature story because although the temperature has been stable now, the you know there've been some recent discoveries like the Bakri Tapi. Um, and the civilization there, and, and uh, civilization is going strong long before agriculture. So you can see them making beer there. Um, it's, it's clearly um, a religious site. So then, you know, they come and they say, well, it's a religious first uh, theory now, which is gaining precedent, but it's neither. What they won't accept, and it's so obvious, but, you know, um, Archaeologists are really high bound. I got I got my first few dislikes um, for this video I made for, uh, on on the subject. I went to Gobekli Tepe and filmed this uh, this thing, uh, uh, one of my videos. Actually, I'd love it love you to watch it and see what you think if you can spare uh, uh, probably 
tedious <laughs> hour or something to watch. <laughs> but anyway, they, um, if we, I tricked some archaeologists. One of them was the archaeologist with the back to Tappy, and they absolutely loved it. I got into a bit of dialogue, but but I could tell, I had so few viewers, I could tell where they actually bombed out. And it was Gordon Child's theory. The, the, you know, they, this idea that there's something sacred about agriculture and it generated civilization, but it's completely back to front. It's, civilization started first. The Beckley Tuffy is a, is a site where people are meeting, like I, I kind of equate in the video to something like Burning Man. And people are desperate. They're kind of selling, you know, they want in and they, they're selling. They're basically, you know, basically hot dog salesmen and stuff for the guys going to the festival. And that's how agriculture starts. And then, you know, they clearly deplete the, the environment three times. Uh, and they do it over each time, but each time it doesn't work so well because the environment is depleted. And then it basically, it, it ended because, you know, the bushfire just moved on to a rook and all these other cities. And we just carried the bushfire on until now it's global size, but it really started there. So oh, just okay. uh, just one one more thing before uh, you speak. And I, um, so I think what they're missing is that there was clearly commerce. So trading is going on very far back. You can go and see uh, in, in um, say, northern Algeria, there's a whole bed of tools um, that, you know, they have pyramid. It, you know, if you, if you look at all the, st uh, the hand axes and stone tools in maybe a kilometer square, they form a pyramid, a literally a pyramid of Giza size uh, thing. It's, it's fantastic amounts. And it does, isn't warranted by hunting and gathering. So to me, it's clear what's happening. It's, it's commerce. They, they actually, you having there in the archaeological record is plainly um, a boom and bust cycle. You're seeing that they're using hand axes and, uh, you know, basically arrowheads as currency. And they're making, they're making them for their own, own self. They, they've gone beyond the utility of, um, of an axe head. And now they're using it as common and garden currency. And so you get an inflation. Eventually you see these quarries where every man and his dog is spending all his time not doing hunting and gathering. He's making stone tools for trade in the market. And, they, you know, the trade networks, the obsidian, uh, you know, how it, how it tracks. You can see the locality. It doesn't match the fact that the genes are moving, but clearly the goods are moving because you can find, you know, Neanderthals have traded and stuff. So clearly trade comes first. So then when, you know, the first time you can really get a massive festival going on, it's a trading festival. It's a big outdoor swap meet. And then that leads to agriculture. You know, the stable temperatures then allow this whole swap meet thing to get out of control. And I think that I would like you to see the video and see what you think. But that's my take. What do you say? Sure. And, and my response to that is let's expand the notion of food storage or food security beyond grains. Okay, let's agree that the ability to grow grains at this stable temperature appeared somewhere in the last few thousand years. But sure, there was food security. There were opportunities for food security before that. Okay, so now I think we're redefining civilization in a way that actually makes sense. If it is about storing food or securing food, and if the ability to secure food comes at the point of a gun or the point of an arrowhead, then I don't see that as being a lot different than growing grains at relatively large scale. The ability to hunt animals at relatively large scale is sufficiently to allow overshoot by the human population, locally or regionally. I think that's, that's the critical point here, is that civilizations, and I interviewed a guy on my radio show years ago, I can't remember his name, who talked about uh, short-term food storage and longer-term food storage. And, and we're clearly in the realm of longer-term with the ability to grow, store, and distribute grains at scale. But, but if, we, if we go back to not including grains as the only kind of food, which of course makes sense if we go back before the last ice age, then sure, I, I can certainly accept the idea that food security comes by other means and allows human population overshoot as one result. Yeah, so also here I'm a bit of a, a heretic, I'm afraid. Um, the, I think that evidence doesn't support this idea of, of food security because uh, although agriculture allows overshoots, 
Um, they overshoot three times. You can see it clearly in the archaeological record in, in Gebekli Tepe. So this is, um, you know, uh, 10,600 years ago. And so way before agriculture, it's pre-pottery Neolithic we're talking about. And these, um, but uh, here's the thing about food security. If you, James Scott, uh, for example, um, has, uh, has written about um, how, well, actually, I think there's lots of evidence of this, that, that if you have a look at comparative hunter-gatherers and people that are in these agricultural communities, they, they're smaller, they have, they're less healthy. Um, they, they have uh, bone, bone defects from things like uh, excessive labor. Uh, so, so clearly, uh, the hunter-gatherers were taller, more robust, more healthy, more long-lived. So it's strange that they actually opt for civilization with its taxation and it's uh, basically almost guaranteed that you'll be conscripted into an army, basically used as cannon fodder. It's strange that people have the option, and you can see it right there, that they have the option to be hunter-gatherers because the environment is still intact, but they forgo that, that better lifestyle and go into this other lifestyle, and it, it demands an explanation. I think what they, is happening, it's, it's really akin to, say, a drug den, or maybe a, a nightclub, or something that you might see in contemporary, you know, big city today. And these people are going there for the drugs. It's a drug culture. You have the big boss who owns the club, who sets it up, has the doorman, and, uh, you know, people are in this agricultural habit, but uh, it's, it's killing them. Okay, you, you stopped there, but uh, yeah, I so said that the people are in this habit and it's killing them. It's like a drug habit. Right. Well, I don't think we're that far apart, actually. I think that the overshoot can cut. It's interesting that, you know, even we, relatively few people, maybe, maybe more than I imagine recognize that this set of living arrangements is not particularly healthy. It's hard to step away. It's almost impossible to step away without being just dis disparaged by the system. And because of, again, our evolutionary past, we don't like that to happen to us. We all appreciate and thrive off of the mm, good vibes from other people. So, at what point, I guess this is, this is the critical issue, where do we place the blame and does that help? Does that help placing the blame at any particular well, period? I think it's part of the information. So if, um you and I agree on this uh, strategy, and I think we do, is that you know we need to put the information at people's hands. I mean, I would go further than that. I mean, I come from Africa, and in Africa, there's an old saying that if, if one person could tell our story, he would save us all. So I am doing my best to try and tell our story, and it's, uh, it's just full of hogwash and self-interest. And one of the hogwash and self-interest things is this aggrandizement of, of culture and civilization and agriculture. And I try to make people think in other ways and particularly analyzing the word cult in culture and stuff. And then it's, it is all a cult. Uh, basically we've got ourselves into a snuff cult. And um, uh, yeah, I'm in some of my videos, I say that it's very difficult to get out of it without forming a new cult. It's almost that, you know, cult is a uh, collective noun for basically our intellect. Um, so, so uh, yeah, what, the trouble with people from Jim Jones to um, David Koresh um, to Marshall Applewhite, all these, these cult leaders, and I know you've been called a cult leader too, and I, I have this too, actually, because basically we're trying to lead these people out of the cult. Um, and so, you know, I, I try to get people to see that culture is is great. I mean, I love culture. I love the, you know, cities. I've always said, but, but like, at what price? I don't, I don't love the statue of David so much that I would sacrifice people for it. But people have been. People are trained now to go and admire the, the, um, the Fuzi and stuff like that, and to go and Google over all the, you know, masterpieces in Italy. But you say, 
those were bought with, uh, you know, tedious pain and the De Medici's and all these people, you know, oppressed people did desperately, this slavery just dripping out of those statues. And we think they all great. And say, so, like, not only do you need to question that, I mean, it's great from the point of view that it's a fantastic, um, it's, it's a spectacle that, that this, this chimp did all this stuff. But it's also a horror that it's like, and it killed itself. You've got to underline it that these statues, this civilization is a killer. So don't go to Mommy or the, I mean, you know, Museum of Modern, Modern Art, MoMA, something like that, and, and say, you know, this is unadulteratedly fantastic. It's like at a price. The price is, right. is now species. It's, uh, it's fantastic and it's horrifying. Right. You know, Edward Abbey almost always spelled culture with a K acknowledging that there was this cost associated with inculturization are and and you're right about the whole cult part of culture i think civilization whenever it arose each time it arose represented an amazing sales job i mean as nearly as I can tell, in every case, here were people who were reasonably happy, who didn't have to work very hard to secure what they needed in life, which is a decent human community and the ability to eat and drink and dance and all those other things that they deemed were important for their well-being beyond survival. And then civilization comes along, whether it be defined by trade or the ability to store food, the ability to secure food. In every case, the job skills for the individual became much narrower. So that now we have people within this set of living arrangements who have to wear wrist braces all the time they're working because the job requires it. So they're so miserable for eight or nine or 10 hours a day that they have to put on a prosthetic so that they can complete their work. And nobody seems to complain about that. Everybody just says, well, it's part of the deal. There are a whole bunch of parts of the deal that are really horrible. And so I agree, acknowledging the horrors of this set of living arrangements is a great first start. Let's not, act as if every version of civilization, including the one that we're in, is the highbrow, consummate way for humans to live. So, um, would you speak a bit about the tyranny of time? So I, I, my last video, I, I, I've been a bit scarless, I've got to admit. I fear I'm admitting on YouTube I've been a bit scarless. I, I, I am a that's gonna, special... That's going to come back at you, you know. I know, I just, I, I might have to edit it out, but, I'm, but anyway, I, I am a perpetual troll, and um, that's that's my way of feeding people information and getting them to think, but what I've been doing is I've um, been trolling um, our favorite organization, XR, and telling them they only need one demand, and that's to, you know, take the concept of chronological time and out of context. So you demand that you not a you know it's automatically nullifying any contract or agreement that has uh, you know the concept of chronological time a date a period and it is self nullifying. Of course, the ramifications of that is our civilization falls apart. The financial industry <laughs> falls apart. You can't do interest. You can't do actually you know the whole thing just comes unstuck with that one demand. But I was really trying to get people to think in terms of time, in terms of you know their logo is we are running out of time, you know, the tyranny of time that basically they got people, like you say, with prosthetics on their arm to do this nine to five job. And uh, it's the oldest trick in the book. It's uh, what Mark said is, you know, they you know, pay people for their time, but keep their work product. They stole the work product, and knowing that that's far more valuable than the time. And then they use monopsony pricing to uh, get, you know, wage slaves to compete against each other so they can drive down wages. And that's still one of the things that the Fed is openly says it's doing, it doesn't even hide it. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to get people to start thinking in terms of time. And I think, you know, it's, it's, too, it's too imaginative for XR and XR may, may be compromised anyway. But anyway, I, I, for the few people that read it, I hope I stimulated them to. To think in terms of the tyranny of time and how um, you know, 
There are other types of time in Greece, there's Kairos and Kronos, not just Kronos. But our cult has become you know, obsessed with Kronos. Um, the computer is just a, basically an offshoot of Kronos. Uh, the, you know, the clock is, uh, is Kronos. So I bet, you know, there's Kairos too. That's, you know, time and tide and uh, the winds and the fates and, you know, the time of opportunity, you know, make hay while the sun shines. And a lot of the, what we've been doing in terms of green energy has been, we've been trying to get Kairos, which is like, say, wind energy and solar energy and, and then force them into a chronological delivery, which is kind of what agriculture is doing too. It's trying to enforce a regular output from something that's irregular. And mm -hmm. then Trump comes along and says, wow, oh, you can't use all this green, green tech because it's, you know, the sun doesn't shine anymore the, every, you know, reliably. The wind doesn't blow reliably. And you say, yes. So the conclusion is not that we need technology that's chronological. It means that we must stop living chronologically. We must start living according to green tech. So when, you know, make hay when the sun shines, but stay in bed when the sun doesn't shine, don't fight the traffic and commute into work. This, this kind of thinking. But what do you think of, of that thing? I, I think Kronos is a product of civilization that is, has become a self-reinforcing feedback loop. That we adhere to the concept of time, look at the nine to five or the eight to five, and 30, should you be 30 seconds late for work? It's the end of the world. It might be the end of your paycheck. And, and that's how Mm, imprisoned we have become by time. I couldn't agree more. Yes, Kronos is a bad idea. Unless I'm teaching the class and it's the students who are showing up late, then it's a good idea. <laughs> you know, and you see how easy, that's how easy it is. So easy, but it's, that's what a cult is. It stops you thinking, right? Yes, absolutely. So uh, it, it's one of those things, how are we going to unwind it? You know, you, we can't uninvent fire. I, well, here's the thing. I've had a lot of, I, I'm kind of a scurrilous type, and I've had a lot of fun over the years, um, you know, experimenting with this kind of, but one of the things you can do is just a new perspective. So kind of the, you know, just a new zeitgeist. For example, take a trivial example, um, but the absurdists and that, they all recognize this and discordians and they, but uh, you know, just to take a simple example, if ever a, a rich, asshole friend of mine or something like this has happened to me before, I'll use this as an example, is, uh, you know, spent a lot of money on a fantastic picture and they're showing it off, you know, it's, they have this great work of art above the fireplace and they're trying to, you know, trying to look uh, sophisticated. And so they show this picture off to me. And uh, instantly I, I, I couldn't help myself, but I went, yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Have you just looked at this piece over here? It just looks like Mickey Mouse ears. Can you see? There's Mickey Mouse's face. And uh, when I did it, the guy was absolutely furious. For him. He said, you realize now I cannot look at that picture again without seeing Mickey Mouse? And I said, really? <laughs> I never <laughs> thought of that. <laughs> and so I ruined the picture for him. So they, they not only have I broken his behavior, cracked his ego, and basically given him a moment of zen. Uh, but I just did it. The pointing out the absurdity of our situation is something that I could campaign on. Like it's been lost, you know, John Paul Sartre, all those great guys from the 60s. It, it's, kind of, it's kind of very unsubtle now. I mean, uh, you know, subtlety has been lost on the internet. But you can't do a suggestion to XR that's vaguely you know, um, subtle, absurdist, anything that would make people think. Uh, but it's got to be just flat out there that, you know, anybody can make into a sound bite and anybody on the opposite uh, polar extreme can, you know, basically dismiss equally easily. And I'm trying to get people to think more in terms of uh, being more, more subtle, to being more absurdist, making people think. So you have an obscure demand, like, you know, taking time out of context. Now, you can't dismiss that. Even, even the worst climate denier has got to say, what the hell are you on about? And you say, ah, oh, thank you for opening the door. Can I point you out how your whole worldview has Mickey Mouse here in the corner and <laughs> is completely ridiculous. <laughs> uh, sorry, I trashed your whole life, you know, that kind of thing. What do you think? Right. No, uh, you know, that's what I tried to do for 21 years in the classroom was introduce a new perspective was, you know, one of my favorite exercises, students, I would ask students to write. And of course they couldn't because we all have this block against writing. 
So I would teach them a trick I learned from a writer whose name I can't remember right now. <coughs> you don't know what to write? Reduce the world down to this. Just look at the smallest frame of the world because the world is too much. You know, we're trying to, we're trying to fix the world here. We're trying to solve world problems, but we can't because it's just me and you and 14 other people who are interested in that sort of thing. So <coughs> let's reduce the frame to something this big, to this manageable. Let's write about whatever falls within that frame and then use that starting point, that frame as the point of reference for expanding the knowledge, expanding the conversation. And that's where I think you're going and that's where I've been trying to go for a very long time is focus on the individual leading to changes in society. What, what can we do as individuals, as provocateurs, as teachers, as people willing to ask the most absurd of questions, we can get an individual to think about those questions and therefore sell that painting because of the Mickey Mouse ears or whatever. Or ruin right? the painting. I'm trying to ruin the painting. <laughs> <laughs> ruin it for that individual. Yeah. So he's able to sell it to somebody else, but pretty soon, if we're successful, we've ruined it for the entire society. And that's you can, the job. You can teach people to ruin the painting. So if you, if you can basically take people and, and teach them the art of destroying the idea of civilization for people, uh, and then, you know, ridicule humor, uh, you know, it comes into it. And basically, we, we just, you know, where, where have all the uh, surrealists gone? I mean, you know, uh, we need a few more surrealists, don't we, in terms of painters and writers? And so, I mean, as the world gets more and more surreal. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. But they're selected against. Yeah. As, as every civilization reaches its end, people become more and more focused on, the, on how great they are and how, how well they fit in to society. Everybody's trying to fit in to an even greater extent. And that's how you get your rewards in life is by maximally fitting in. It, absurdism is dead, as near as I can tell. And yeah. with Camus. Actually, you just sent shivers down my spine there because when when uh, when I started in computing, there were there were lots of characters. There were it was very you know it was a wacky thing to get into um, when when it wasn't mainstream. Um, oops, I'm showing my, old, my age now, but uh, so but as I've been over the years, it's got more and more robotic until eventually, um, you know, Jeff Bezos has set the low point where if you work at Amazon, um, in, which is in my hometown in Seattle, I know a lot of people that's going to work there, but uh, they openly say, you know, we, we must be more machine, we must be more robotic, we must be, and I say like, listen to yourselves, what are you saying? Uh, but that's that's a, a corporate goal um, to to basically behave more like an automaton, and it's very easy to get uh, to find articles written by you know these capos who like mi middle management that say you know this is how you get the people to be more about it. this is how you select for robotic compliant uh, drones. So yeah, the system moves everybody towards Kronos predictability, and because the guys can be exploited if they if they're regular, repeatable, they drones um, you know. You can't make a good good living out of a random number. So people that are unusual are a threat to the system, and they've been weeding. I've seen through my career they've weeded them all out, and now it's appalling. I as I feel like I'm you know in uh, in the work environment with zombies. It's uh, very hard for me to work in the modern environment in America because the whole culture is degenerated into things like the agile development methodology. If you look at the Agile Man Manifesto, which has been adopted more and more extensively, it's basically trying to conform uh, roboticism on people. It's it's a kind of Taylorism for the intellect. You know, Taylorism, the, where Taylor broke down all the, the skills of the skilled worker so that they could all be, you know, basically stolen so that there was no skill left. He just took it. So every, every task was broken down into something that could be automated. Um, and, and so there was no skill involved. And then that's, that's the way the management broke at the back of the skilled work. Um, so if you, so if you one thing we have to keep in mind, one thing we have to keep in mind, um, Star Trek, the next generation. Do you remember the uh, Borg? 
I'm not a big techie. Yeah, but okay. <laughs> Go with so, it. A lot of people know about the Borg. And yeah, the Borg just kept insisting that resistance is futile. And it appeared that everything, everything and everybody was going to be subsumed by the Borg. And, and many, many civilizations had already gone that route throughout interplanetary history. And as nearly as we could tell, it only took one person resisting, Jean-Luc Picard, the captain on the ship. He resisted and he successfully broke the Borg. So remember, what most people remember from that series of, of episodes is that resistance is futile because the Borg said it over and over and over. But look at the outcome. Resistance was fertile. It was not futile. And it was only one person. So it begins with us and the sort of resistance that you're suggesting by educating people into questioning everything, I think is a perfectly reasonable form of resistance. Well, let's... So I think we're um, at an hour, and I, I thank you very much for, for this highly interesting conversation, at least from my point of view. Um, once again, I would like to um, ask if we could continue it later sometime down the road. Um, and yeah, if, if you don't mind, I'll send you a few emails of um, other thoughts. And I, I would really love you to watch that uh, Gabbathi Tapi video just to, to see what you think of my heterodox <laughs> thoughts put out on the internet for everybody to piss on, basically. Well, it's unusual that, first of all, there's a guy named Gerald Spence, who was a relatively well known attorney. You might know of him. He successfully de defended Emil de Marcos based on the law. He became quite despised for that. Uh, he had a book, no, he had a, a, a little plaque on his desk and he might've written a book with the same title, I'm not sure, but he had a plaque on his desk that said, please argue with me. And he pointed out in whatever book of his I read, it might've been with that title and maybe not, he pointed out that that's the way we progress. That's the way we move our positions, if only slightly, if only subtly. And so this conversation today, which in which you raised a disagreement, is wonderful because that's how we learn. We don't learn by the robotic, we learn nothing important, I should say, by the robotic algorithm-driven system that most of us are embedded in right now that tells us perfectly well how to create computing technology, but doesn't tell us how to think, doesn't tell us how to find the absurd in the mundane. And those are the things that I think are important. So that you disagreed with me, I view as a good thing. And yeah, it that, that, that fits with uh, Shannon's information theory. So in computing and information technology, they Really, if you repetitive, um, there's no information content in that stream. In other words, it's compressible and it's compressible to nothing. It's only if uh, you have new information, which is random and contradictory and unpredictable, that it's not compressible. That's the definition, um, Shannon's definition of, of, um, of energy, uh, or rather of information. Anyway, there are lots of fascinating discussions still to be had. Right, and Shannon's ideas have greatly influenced not just the computing industry, but the statistics industry as well. You know, I was learning about Shannon's ideas in graduate school with the focus on statistical computing, on trying to determine the difference between A and B. Yeah, I, actually, there's a whole fascinating discussion to be had by the, uh, by the postmodernists, on the postmodernists and Wheeler and uh, his interpretation of it for bit and stuff of the information applied to, to physics. Um, and, you know, physicists now accept that the, the world is just information. And, of course, then you get this complete industry of bollocks around uh, entropy. But the cyberneticists... Um, they were all, all about the first computers and really making um, the world robotic, uh, pretty much Viva style. In fact, I think my next video is will be on on them and the Hilbert program and, and that idea of um, you know uh, logicism, uh, trying to get the world to to behave like clockwork. Um, and we do live in their clockwork world. They kind of shaped our worlds uh, much like Eddie Bernays did. 
um, in stealth. Um, but the cybernetics impact on our world has been extreme, and yet almost nobody knows about them. Almost nobody knows about Frege and the, um, you know, the Hilbert program. Those mathematicians that tried to put us in the box um, very, very successfully. But a fascinating story for, I, I think I will start recording that with you. <laughs> let's, let's round it off here, unless you, do you want to complete this with a um, comment? Well, thanks for the opportunity, and I look for, forward to our next conversations because they're far more interesting than almost everything else that goes on in my life. So, you know, at this point in my life, I'm trying to balance life is short, you know, no matter how much time we have left, and I don't want to argue about that. Life is short for all of us, and I'm trying to balance that with, but there's so many new interesting things so many more interesting ideas that I haven't properly considered that I haven't gone deeply into. And you're pushing me to do that. So I very much- I'm, I'm gorging myself on it. I'm, I mean, especially, I'm, I'm going back to our roots here in Greece. Mm -hmm. uh, so they had it all, they had it all down here. It's just a matter of uncovering it. So yeah, I'm, I'm gorging myself. I'm sorry you, you can't share in the feast. <laughs> <laughs> I drop a few yes. videos out occasionally just to annoy people. So thanks again for the chat and I look forward to the next one. So do I. Thank you very much, guys.